Hey folks, Steve here with another Fall of the Third Reich video. Today we'll be looking at turn 9. And the game is getting closer and closer to a conclusion, uh, at least time-wise. We have basically four turns left to go, which will probably equate to four videos uh, or less, depending on how the next uh, just, you know, couple of turns go, I guess. A um, couple of things. Uh, this will be the last turn before we have another set of winter turns, so 10 and 11, if I'm playing with the winter weather optional rule, uh, those turns will be winter turns, uh, which reduces sort of the operational capability of uh, the Soviets, uh, essentially, in terms of attacking. Um, now I'll say, it may not really matter, because the wide expanses of Russia are, are not really as relevant now, we're sort of coming in a central... Europe or, you know, Eastern, Near Eastern Europe, um, and the, you know, sort of uh, placement of cities and towns are enough that, you know, the, the Soviets are still likely going to be able to operate quite well, um, I would think, I would hope, that's the idea. Um, so, uh, we'll be looking at that. Before we get too f deep into the reinforcements, of which there are quite a few, uh, even the Soviets actually get some reinforcements. Um, I want to talk a little bit so far uh, in terms of progress as the ally. So um, if you were to compare sort of this rough map that I'm showing on screen now of where the front lines are to say um, a you know a like day by day video like you can look up on YouTube World War II Europe every day and it'll show you know someone put a lot of work into showing you know how the front lines changed every day you can watch the whole war in like 10 minutes, basically, or 17 minutes or something like that. Um, being able to see where the front lines are. So if you were to look at, you know, November 1st, 1944, uh, where would we be in comparison to that? Well, we're ahead of time uh, in Italy, right? We've basically swept into northern Italy and captured Milan and all those areas. Um, that part of the front is pretty much over where I think historically in this time you still had... Um, sort of a northern Italian, maybe the northern Italian puppet state was still in existence here, but it was really, you know, the, the front line was manned by Germans uh, for the most part. You know, that's pretty much gone, um, which is interesting because, it, as you recall, if you watched every video, and bless you if you did, um, we had a really late start to getting into Sicily and, and the boot heel of... Uh, boot heel of Italy. So the fact that we've kind of cleaned up here, I think it's, you know, over here, is just indicative of me not spending a lot of reinforcements down there. I spent more time trying to put units on the west front early or sending all my reinforcements to the east, um, that kind of thing. Um, and I really sort of ended up ignoring the Italians after a while because I figured, well, hey, we delayed them, you know, or they got delayed by bad invasions. Maybe they don't need as much help. But, you know, the, the line over here was pretty much... No, I should probably just remove these. Um, the, the line down there was, was pretty much um, uh, right here, uh, you know, not heavily... I mean, it was defended, but not super heavily defended. Um, and so, you know, as things kind of broke out from there, you know, it sure used delaying tactics, but it didn't mean a whole lot in the larger context of things. So we're ahead of time uh, in the Mediterranean front. Um, and I guess, actually, this is just the camera, but I shouldn't have. Uh, in terms of the Balkan front, we're... I, I think we would say that I'm ahead of time um, in terms of, like, Yugoslavia. So Yugoslavia has been um, liberated, basically, and we're pushing into Slovakia and Hungary, um, which is maybe a little bit ahead. I mean, it's awfully close. I think historically they were like in here and we're just a little bit ahead uh, and taking all of this over here a bit early. Um, but I think, I can't remember now for Greece. I'll, I'll have to go look it up whether or not Athens or Greece have been liberated. But um, up here in the, in the generally the east part of the front. We're actually still a little bit behind because of Riga. Um, we just didn't quite have um, a really great 
set of towns or cities around Riga. That's kind of the weird thing. Like, I, I've sort of slowed down there because I'm either having to spend a Stavka marker in Talinin or, or a Stav, like, to try to activate these units for combat um, to take Riga, which then gives us a larger launching point. But the fact that the Germans have been able to hold on to Riga for so long with multiple stacks of units has kind of slowed things down a lot. And I think that speaks to the overall mechanics of the game where, yeah, it, if you can try to defend a city as the Axis on retreat, you really want to, because once that city flips, the Soviets just have so much more operational capability using that infrastructure, where if you can hold on to some of those critical areas, it, you, you can delay quite a bit, um, which is why, you know, the war is now becoming less of a east-west war and may becoming a north-south war between the Soviets and the Axis in the terms to come, just because we're, we're you know, we're we're penetrating up now, you know, um, and then it'll be maybe less relevant. These guys are stuck out here because they're just going to get cut, cut off anyway. I have to decide when I'm going to pull back because as it stands right now, you can see um, I'm heading up this way. Like I'm going to maybe capture a bunch of guys, you know, force them to surrender. If that's a feasibility. They got to try to pull out. And if they just pull out over here, I mean, we probably need to pull back at some point here soon. Um, just, you know, I think I think part of the gameplay balance is figuring out, and this, I guess, goes for any game like this where you're on the defensive uh, strategically. Like, when do you hold? When do you retreat? When do you hold? When do you retreat? You know, Riga's a great line. There's a, there's a river line there that helps a lot on defense, but at what point, you know, are, am I pressed everywhere else where it doesn't make sense to hold that good ground anymore because it's not going to do me any good in the backfield, right? That's sort of a decision-making process. Um, in the west, western front, northwestern front, in France, I am behind a little bit. Um, so, I guess there's not a whole lot to say there, just the fact that um, we, we are behind. That's the reality. We're behind. Uh, I think historically we would be approaching that Fort Work line or somewhere around here historically by this point. So the, the Germans still kind of, you know, they technically still hold Paris, though it's just a garrison force that will be starved out here very shortly. Uh, but then we still have a lot, you know, a lot of those units, a lot of units that I had designated to help defend uh, the West are in place. We still have units, oddly enough, underneath these first U.S. Army Group markers. They don't go away until we push further uh, east as the Western Allies. So, I, you know, it, it's meant to convey, you know, these guys are kind of uncertain as to where additional Allied landings are. I, You know, I, there's probably, in the rules, it's simply a, like, proximity trigger. I think it, there probably ought to be a timing trigger because now it's been six months, <laughs> five to six months since the landing and these guys are still stuck out here. So I don't know. There, there's probably a rule change there worth happening, but what's, what's really probably going to happen is that I'm going to get guys up here and then they're going to be cut out of supply and they're going to go poof anyway. It doesn't, I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, just, I don't know, interesting to see how all this plays out. Because they're in supply because they trace, you know, to local towns over here, and then they can trace kind of through here and through this gap. But if I send these guys north, I can probably cut that off. So, I don't know. Uh, in, in terms of, you know, like I said, it, you know, you look at it historically, it's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm ahead in some areas, I'm behind in others. Um, but now that the, the Balkan front is over with, you know, it becomes very much less of a concern. I can focus on driving north. Uh, the Italian front being over means uh, I can start to either, you know, and, and, I'm, and I've already started to do it, I can send some units up this way to support the northwestern front. I can send units, you know, um, and I'm not sure what's faster at this point, either sending them up this way with operational movement or... Uh, trying to put them on ports and get them back to the Mediterranean box and then transport them to the England box so that they can be transported uh, to northern France. I think it actually, now that I'm looking at it, it might actually be a lot faster um, to move some of these guys up this way. You know, we can't really press 
into southern Germany because there's supply logistic challenges. I need to basically leave these two uh, Commonwealth units to kind of just make sure the Germans don't do something sneaky. But the rest of these guys, I, at this point, maybe just need to go up and around. That That's going to be faster than, like, three turns of transit movement. That just doesn't make sense um, to do. They, they can get pretty far just walking, I think. Um, maybe the only other ones we'd send to the boxes are the paratrooper units because they can be deployed for, you know, via paratrooping uh, from England boxes, which is something I should point out. Like, I have my paratroopers on the continent kind of acting as additional steps and combat factors, and, and I was mostly doing that because I just kind of needed the factors early because we needed to kind of take territory and hold it as we expanded our beachhead. Now, I, I think it just makes more sense to pull those guys back, get them into the, the England box so they can, they, they can be deployed as actual, um, as actual paratroopers. Because the way it works is they don't deploy from the map, they deploy from the boxes, England or Mediterranean box, and you pick a hex, four hexes from a supplied allied unit and they can drop into that hex four hexes away. Now, you know, it, it's a weird abstraction, right? Like, why couldn't they just deploy from that hex somewhere over here? Um, I, I think it's just the staging of the paratroop transport planes are coming out of England, so they have to be in England, I guess. I don't know. I, I, I guess that's the way to, to look at it. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, Maybe there's a better way to represent that, or, you know, maybe it's too much flexibility if you're able to just do it all the time. I mean, I would be sending them behind those lines constantly, disrupting supply and all kinds of craziness, so maybe it's better that it takes that long to do it. I don't know. Consideration stuff that's floating into my mind as I play through the game, because we're going to be reaching the point, you know, where the game will be over before too long, um, and I'll, you know, have to, have to really think through everything that happened and what and the why and... All that good stuff. So, okay, guys, uh, I'll, I'll do a cut here because uh, this is kind of a long intro. But I, again, I think it's important. The video I did last was really short because I just I went through the turn fast and I only talked about what happened. I didn't show it directly. I'll probably try to do the same thing here so that the video is not very long. Um, but I, you know, basically I'm replacing that hemming and hawing, moving counters around with um, the sort of analysis stuff. So that's just, you know, 12 minutes of analysis and commentary might be better than 12 minutes of me double checking a rule and maybe rolling a die and, you know, grieving over the die roller, that, that sort of thing. Now that you have probably seen enough of the game, you've seen the die rolls that you kind of know how the game works, right? If you've been watching all the way up till now, you know how the game works. Now you're just, you're, you're here spectating the end of my game and seeing how it goes and how the balance goes as we reach the end state. So I think that's the mode we'll, we'll take here. So thanks for watching. Uh, catch you later. And, or yeah, later. <laughs> catch you later. You guys are going to see it in a second. I'm going to take a break and then I'll record more. So yeah, see you in a second. Okay, so we're going to get into the reinforcements. The Axis actually does, uh, the Germans, get uh, several units. Um, now they're all C or worse. I mean, I guess, you know, that's technically worse, right? Um, a two value is worse than a C, probably. Um, five units, and one of them is armor, but it's a C, which doesn't... a C-grade one, which means, like, it <laughs> doesn't project Zox for Soviet exploitation. I think that's, such a, that's like, the huge critical part of, <laughs> of the situation, is, like, we got to plug these gaps, my friends. Um, so, uh, I think where they're going to end up going uh, is we're going to put one in loads, we're going to put two in the USIR, we're going to put one in Vienna, and oh gosh. I don't know. We'll put we'll put another one in Vienna. We'll we'll stack up Vienna a little bit. Um, and as I place these reinforcements, something I, I just want to I'll, I'll talk more about this in the post mortem when we get there. Um, but the thing I want to call out is like there there are some really interesting threads on Board Game Geek about like the East Front and how can the Germans stay alive and and 
is it imbalanced or you know what's the coherent strategy I, I'll have a lot more to talk about in that video almost as a response to the threads on the subject and maybe I'll do a text write-up of my thoughts just to add to that conversation in case folks don't watch this video um, <clears throat> is that like every time I have reinforcements as the axis or, or replacements if I can I'm trying to sure yeah put them in the front line whatever what I'm really doing is using those guys and as far as I can send them forward as sort of defining a new line that needs to be fallen back to um, rather than just sort of throwing them to the wind like really trying to structure them in some organized way where it's like okay I, here's the new line you know however I can fill it that might be the hard part but at least I know what my line's going to be and and doing my best to pull back to it if I can and leverage you know, multiple units per hex and, and multiple step units and all that stuff. Um, and what's interesting is that, like, if I look at, um, when, when I look at the combat charts, what I notice is that, you know, unless you're getting, I mean, two to one odds, I'm trying to think, two to one odds is pretty good. You can get two to one odds you know, as the Soviets, that's a pretty decent rule. Um, but you don't really know that you're going to get two to one odds because the value of the C rated units or the B rated units or the A rated units are, might fluctuate and then you get less than two to one odds. And if you have anywhere from, you know, one to one odds, meaning zero or plus one on the combat results table, you know, anywhere between here and here, you're going to notice, like, there's a lot of these AA results. You're very likely going to get these AA results, these type of results. And the thing about the AA results are um, that, like, <laughs> you could spend, like, five, and I've done this. I've had these combats occur in my game where it's like, I just lost five Soviet steps and the Germans lost one. And when you realize that the replacement rate, you know, as the as the Soviets gets worse over time, and it's really never great, like, if you blow five steps on one combat, you're going to spend most of your replacements that next turn on just replacing that one combat. So I think there was a comment somewhere on BoardGameGeek talking about, like, oh, well, if the Soviets just do a bunch of these, you know, one-to-one to two-to-one -one odds attacks, they'll just overwhelm the Germans. But, like, okay, at, yeah, at first, that might work. Right when you're way back here, off you know, off, off camera map, fighting, and you're eliminating that first line, sure. But as the Germans start establishing a, a secondary line or a tertiary line or whatever, um, you know, it, okay, you as the Soviets have just spent so much manpower on not having gained a whole lot, because most of those one to one or or somewhere between one to one and two to one odds are going to be highly attritional, highly attritional. And, and even if you say, well, the, the, the Soviet replacement rate is very high, and sure, it, it's pretty good, you can find yourself outspending your replacements, you know, having, having more losses than you can replace in a given turn, if you're really trying to do just those low odds attacks, that, okay, then the Germans set up again, you know, they try to form a coherent line, and you've bled so many units that you can't even replace, you know, replace them, you're going to find yourself in a difficult position because here's the reality. If, if the Germans can manage on the West Front, or even before turn six in general, right, there's nothing happening over here unless the Allies are trying to an, an early invasion, in which case, you know, the whole game's goofy, and stuff down here, right, they have to manage that. But they can afford to spend a lot of their replacements, likely, on the East Front, right, even with factory bombing, right? The, the odds of factory bombing are only so high right? Sometimes I hit, sometimes I miss, the allies have to rebuild their thing, whatever. You can still get several replacements over on the East Front. And what's interesting is, like, the Germans altogether, you know, have a really great replacement rate for a while, um, that they also get a bunch of reinforcements. And often those reinforcements are just as good or more than you're going to get via replacements, and there's no way to affect the reinforcements. You can't factory bomb the reinforcements away that, like, if you pursue those low-odd attack strategies, here's what's going to happen, or could happen, depending on how the dice roll, right? It's just something you have to be aware of. Like, if you are over-eager too early as the Soviets, and you overspend your manpower, the Germans are going to get enough replacement points and enough reinforcements 
that they can locally win combats at higher odds and shut the Soviets down and put them into a death spiral where they're losing more units than can be replaced, in which case the Axis is going to win the game because they you know, will have nullified the Soviets. The, the Axis might not be pushing very you know, far into Soviet territory or anything, but all they have to do is hold you up out here and, and keep you from advancing and beating you up so that you don't have enough combat factors to get good combat odds and you know, disable the Soviets from being able to create holes in the line to exploit. And, and there you go. I mean, they win the game based on an over-eager Soviet just thinking they can throw too much manpower against the wall. When I've attacked, I've tried to make sure I at least have two-to-one odds. Now, that might mean I'm moving a little bit slower in some areas, but I've, you know, I've looked and I've had several turns where I couldn't replace all my losses as the Soviets, and sure, the Germans can't replace that huge dead pile, but they're still getting more units every turn anyway. Um, I still think, you know, we're reaching the point now where the Soviets are going to break the Axis, but but it's mostly because of a steady advance and destruction strategy, not a just throw a bunch of, you know, one-on-one -on -one odd attacks against the wall and see what sticks. That that I don't think that would work. I mean, I think you could try it, and it would seem like it's working at first, um, but but then, you know, you probably wouldn't be make like, by the time that secondary line exists, you might not be making, you know, a whole lot of progress because the line stretches out. And, and I've gotten to this point where, like, yeah, I'm only, I'm only getting a couple of units per hex of the Soviets at best, and that might only add up to, you know, like, eight combat factors, maybe, and a defending German unit might have eight combat factors when you, when you roll the die for the, the core letter value, and then it's a one-to-one, -one. And in which case, yeah, sure, I mean, it, you know, I don't know, I guess I'm rambling at this point, and, and I'm not doing what I said I was going to do, which is actually play the game, but... I just wanted to point this out that like I, it's interesting to see like that many reinforcements, without even replacement points, is still a pretty good amount of units that are going to help slow down the Soviets. We're going to put them in these mountains. They're going to hold things back. Those mountains offer terrain. It's like plus two defense factors. So one unit by itself is somewhere between four to six combat factors, and it takes a lot to you know with the line as long as it is right now for Soviet units to combine enough that you have enough for good odds attacks, right? That's just sort of the reality. Um, and if you lose too many Soviet units, you're, you're not getting anywhere very fast, right? Um, I don't know. Anyway, let, let's get into the rest of the reinforcements here uh, in just a second. Okay, so I just did the, uh, the Allied and Soviet reinforcements. Uh, the Allies got two American mechanized corps in the England box, so um, they, they will be helpful when we get them... Uh, onto the map. I guess the, you know, I guess I don't have to put them in the England box. Technically, I think I'm allowed to put them, uh, let's see. Then you beachhead on the map or any, oh, okay, so I can put these guys in a port, um, and I will do that. I will put them in a ruin. So that's convenient. Put these guys Right there. All right, they're ready to join the party. Um, and let's see. Um, I might actually swing those guys back and just eliminate these units so I don't have to worry about them anymore. Um, and then the Soviets got uh, a, a couple of uh, reinforcements. They got two uh, tank army units and two infantry, and I put most of those to the stacking limit in Lvov, uh, which is... Right over here, with the idea that they're going to help drive that push through here, you know, pointed straight. <laughs> we're we're going to go from here to Berlin. We're going to strike that direction. We'll see how far we get. Um, yeah, so that's it for reinforcements. A pretty, pretty straightforward thing. Um, I will say that, like, the Soviets don't get a lot of reinforcements. They get some reinforcements across the turn. So, so to my previous point that I was making about... The Germans getting lots of reinforcements. Yeah, the Soviets get some too. Um, but, you know, you're, it's the Soviets who are playing against time and eventually have to care uh, about the terrain that the Germans were using defensively. Um, and, like, even forests are actually pretty good defensive terrain. Like, in some games they're not, like, super great, but here they're actually worth, you know, it, 
like the the German line is going to be on this forest line, I think. Right. That's I think that's where we're going to end up going. All right. Strategic air phase. Um, I think we are going to. Um, hmm. Yeah, I I think we're going to leave the Luftwaffe in the home front and on the east front, and then the Allies are going to have uh, factory bombing, factory bombing, and then we are going to do oil bombing, I think, as the for the 15th Air Force. Um, so, yeah, two on factory bombing, that could knock off a lot of production, and then the oil bombing with the hope that I'm almost, honestly, I'm almost tempted to even have the 8th Air Force do oil bombing because if I was fortunate enough to, like, knock out all of the OKW, OKH points, that alone could win me the game now. And so this is, this is I'm almost, i, I got to be careful. I don't want to spoil the post-mortem video. Like, it has seemed like, oh, factory bombing. Just do factory bombing all the time. Like, that's the best thing to do. I'm now reaching a point where I'm like, oh, man, like, Maybe I should do a lot of oil bombing, because if I can keep the Germans from doing anything and just sitting there, then I can eliminate these units and then just surge forward, right? Um, even even with the replacement units, like, it, if it makes more sense to have a positional advantage, maybe I do oil bombing than factory bombing. And I can just cut all these guys out of supply and do a bunch of craziness, but we'll, we'll balance it, right? Two, two Air Force on bombing, factory bombing, one on oil bombing. Targeting oil bombardment, whatever, however you want to call it. Um, okay, and then we'll do the results of the factory bombing right now. So, uh, we're still in 1944, yep. Yeah. And, let's see, target factory. So this is still a minus three to the die roll. And you got to understand, minus three means, like, there's a 50% chance, you know, we might lose something, or I guess... A, Let's see, minus three. Okay, so it's like a thirty, you know, thirty-three percent chance we lose something, and a fifty percent chance nothing happens. But okay, bomber command rolling. I rolled a six, so minus three is three. Um, so that's something we're gonna lose uh, a Luftwaffe, at least for the moment. We'll probably replace it, maybe. But there you go, and then the. 8th Air Force bombing, I rolled a 2, minus 3, so we do lose the 8th Air Force, it was not really eliminated box, the Germans are knocked down 3 replacement points. Um, but uh, yeah, so now we'll deal with the replacement phase off camera, we'll come back uh, after that, um, and yeah, I think that just means that the Germans are going to have nine replacement points, which is what they had last turn. So we, we are keeping them from having their maximum replacement, so that's important. Okay, I did the uh, replacements. The Germans did build back the Luftwaffe unit to put into the east front box. The, the thing with the Luftwaffe, I realized, is like, because you only lose one per turn, no matter how many hits the Allies get, you know, you're not usually totally out of it. Um, it is expensive to maintain for your replacement points, but if you don't spend on it, it's more likely you're going to completely lose and permanently lose Luftwaffe markers. And um, I don't want that to happen, at least not until maybe the last turn or two. So I, I think it's worth the investment, um, but I could be proven wrong as, a, as we find as we find it all out. Um, so uh, we put a few units on the west uh, to kind of help build this fort line, expecting we're going to lose probably some units over here. Maybe a lot of units, I don't know, but we, we put a few over here. We put the majority of the other units built over here. So you can see I'm, I'm still trying to build out a new line that has, you know, at least something of an existing defensive value. Um, you know, we'll look to solidify that line by pulling guys back, I think. If we can shorten the line, you know, I mean, it's a, the line is expanding over here. We need to shorten it over here. So pulling back and then sliding this way, we might be able to cover the gaps a little bit, knowing that the Yugoslavians can't really leave Yugoslavia very far. So it's really the rest of these Soviet units that we're, we're worried about as the Axis. Uh, the Allies um, didn't have to replace a whole bunch, so they had more than enough. Uh, and even the Soviets did this turn build everything back. 
So um, they're going to start having you know a harder time getting all those units built back to the front. But there, there you go. Um, so yeah, everyone's topped off. Uh, so we would normally go to the invasion phase. I don't have any beachhead markers to use right now. They're all being used for supply purposes, or there's no point in pulling off a U.S. marker without the Commonwealth marker. Again, going back to that weird rule where you have to invade both hexes at a landing site, you know, I might try to invade over here or something, but I need both invasion markers to do it, and there's just really no... I, I just don't see a purpose in trying to do that right now, so I, there you go. <laughs> so no invasion. We will eventually, at the end of this turn, pull off the uh, allied beachhead marker, which is used in the med, so that we can invade Athens next turn, uh, which will have the plus two air bonus everywhere. Uh, so... You know, that problem will resolve itself pretty quickly. Late, I think, compared to the historical situation, but, you know, with without much pain and suffering, obviously, so that's the goodness. Uh, we'll probably do it with a Commonwealth unit, just so that if we take a loss, uh, the Commonwealth gets the fewest replacements in 1945. So if we spend a unit, take Athens, it takes a step loss, it's not a big deal. Um, you know, he'll stay out there probably for a while, and we'll focus on replacing Commonwealth units on the West Front. Um, so with the Allied Invasion phase done, we're going to have our OKW, OKH phase. We will have uh, our oil bombing. So uh, we do have a Luftwaffe home defense presence. That's minus three. We control Plutzi, Plutzi, uh, which is a plus two. We don't yet have control of uh, Negikaniska. I, I didn't say that right. I'm sorry. Oh, well. Uh, so it is just a minus one of the die roll, so we hope we roll a six for the oil bombing. Here we go. I rolled a two. <laughs> so we rolled uh, a, let's see, um, it's minus one. So, okay, subtract. Okay, so we did, we actually hit something. So even rolling a two, uh, minus three, the plus two is a minus one. It's a one. Subtract that number of German OK H or OKW, OKH points. So, um, that is just going to be uh, one off the seven. So now the uh, the Axis only has six points to use, which really constrain. you know, even just that one point constrains what they can do quite a bit um, and hurts them. I would have loved to have rolled the six so that we had a minus one and got a five and totally shut down the Axis' ability to respond. We didn't get it, so... Axis got lucky there. Uh, so we'll take that into account as I do the OKW, OKH purchase and placement phase. And then, as usual, uh, I'll go ahead and just do the whole Axis action phase. We'll show the results of that, and then we'll talk about the uh, Allied Soviet reaction phase. Okay, um, so here we are after the Axis operations segment. And um, as you can see, I mean, there, you know, I have this poor guy stuck. He couldn't do anything anyway. But, you know, I, just wherever possible, I'm trying to create something of um, a defense, defensive position, um, at least as much as I can, uh, given the present circumstances. Um, and I did pull back, you know, I was able to save a couple of guys over here. I did pull off down here. Riga is a controlled access port, so we actually have supply there. It can be surrounded. So... We're leaving a few dudes out there just to kind of be, um, you know, some speed bumps just to kind of delay uh, because the Soviets can't operate with those guys in the backfield like that. Um, they have to kind of address Riga no matter what, some way or another. So pulling back a little bit, um, we're going to make use of the forest terrain over here, um, trying to smooth out a line, you know, curving like that. Um, but, you know, we're, we're going to have access attrition here soon, and a bunch of dudes, you know, here, here, over here, are likely going to um, just go poof, which, you know, is a shame, but it, it's kind of hard to get around it. Like, once guys become really trapped, you, you really can't save them unless you are unless you're going to attack and, and force open a line. And an attack is just likely going to get more access step losses. So it's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not saving anybody. You know, if you can't get out, you can't get out. Sorry, sorry, guys. Um, on the west uh, front, there's just not a whole lot, you know, to to do. Um, I thought about pulling back a lot, and 
uh, I just don't know. I, I think pulling back helps to some degree, but what I'm thinking is if we pull back too much, then we're just going to enable the allies to uh, be too close. So if we do break the line, they can exploit even easier into important hexes than if, you know, if they do break through, they may only be able to exploit up to here rather than be here and exploit, you know, into Germany. Um, that's my thinking anyway. Um, the Allies are probably going to have to send a couple of units over here to knock these guys out. Um, we want to try to shut down their supply, but, we, but we're going to reach the, the hex row threshold where they become active, and I just don't want to have to worry about them trying to you know, snatch our beachheads behind us or something. So I, I may just have to send some guys over there to, to knock them out or, or to create Zoc coverage. Um, as a temporary measure. Maybe I should have swung over here and knocked him out sooner because I'm going to be like rushing around trying to do stuff there, but um, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, yeah, so no, no real attacks either, you'll, you'll notice, uh, or I guess I should say, because uh, there, there's just, it's not going to do us any good no matter where we attack. I thought about attacking over here, um, but the reality is like that, you know, the, I've got Zoc issues and I don't have enough strength in a single axis hex, you know, a single axis counter or hex to attack a single allied unit even. A six defense factors, six defense factors for any allied unit is a lot for the Germans to have to deal with in any context. Um, and we just don't have the wherewithal to, to do it. So I think there's like axis counter attacks. Yeah, you should probably do them where you can, but in a lot of cases, it just doesn't make sense to do it. Um, and even over here, like with, like I said, with the Soviets, like I've not, I've not tried to do anything too crazy because even if I leapt out far ahead of my line in the past, I mean, all the Germans have to do is kind of come behind that unit and, and surround it. And then, um, that unit attrits away. So you, you can't, like I read again, comments online about, oh, I, I took a tank army and went way over here and I captured this town. Well, okay, you, all that's going to happen is that unit's going to get cut off and disappear, you know, by the axis. Like, that's just what they're going to do. And, it, you know, I, I think it's a little, I think it's overstated how much, oh, you know, the Soviet unit's going to spring forward and, and, like, be able to get, uh, you know, a crap ton of territory and still be in supply. I, I don't think that's true. I think what you're going to find is... Um, a, a well-maintained axis line in the reaction phase can send a unit or two or whatever to create circumstances where that Soviet unit will be out of supply and will attrit away, and then it stops being a concern for the axis, right? So you, you definitely want to exploit it, but you want to exploit intelligently and exploit in such a way that you're doing like I did over here. You're cutting guys out of supply, not one stray unit or two are bursting so far in the really narrow corridor with operational movement, like, yeah, you can do that, that's neat, but unless it's a game-winning move, um, it's probably not worth it. You're just going to lose units for the, the Axis doing basically nothing. Anyway, um, speaking of, let's do the uh, reaction segments. Uh, so for the Allies, I don't know... I really don't know. Like, reaction movement is so limited. Um... I guess what I could do is I could I could try what I was mentioning before, which is pull some of these guys um, away. One, two, three, four, five, six, and have these guys just sort of set up, you know, to do uh activities to, to destroy these dudes here shortly, right? Kind of takes our American reinforcements, but they can come over here, beat them up, surge back over this way, and then we'll have some of these guys head up north later. So I think that's all That's all good. Um, I don't really see any major issues with that. Um, Soviet reaction, on the other hand, uh, that's a harder thing to decide. What, you know, where are we going to go? Um... You know, is there any place that makes a lot of sense to just 
to rock and roll with. Like, we could try to make something happen here and then have a busted up line. I mean, maybe that's what we do. That might be the preferred path here. Um, Uh, let's see, could anywhere, yeah, we could do, know, oh, it's tough, um, what we could do is do one, two, three, and sort of capture those towns like so, and then they can be used for offensive operations further down or beyond or whatever, and, and yeah, that's probably the better move just for a reaction. It doesn't require us to do much. You might think, oh, let's, let's send a bunch of guys, you know, far afield and, and deep in enemy territory. I, I think you could use a reaction move like that to just set up now, you know, see some territory and set up for the more significant operations shortly. Um, because we place Stavka before we do movement. So I couldn't have moved units like this line forward, capture those towns, and then place Stavka to attack. You have to put Stavka where you already control. So now that I control those towns, I can put Stavka markers there so that when everyone else moves forward, they'll be able to attack. And it, it, it's that sequence of events that is really important to keep in mind. You can't, like, don't think you can you can sort of, like, cheat and uh, do movement and then play Stavka, because then you'd be placing Stavka in places that you just took, and that's not allowed, right? So don't, don't, don't try to make it more convenient for yourself than you think it will be. Um, it's really important that you operate that way, or, you know, the Allies get an unfair advantage, or the Axis get an unfair advantage, depending on what you're doing and playing. Um, okay, and, and they're not going to do combat either. That's purely a operational, uh, you know, mission to grab some towns and extend our operating infrastructure. Um, so now we have the Axis attrition phase. So uh, it's going to be pretty simple. Uh, this guy's out of supply, so two German step losses there. Um, uh, let's see, this guy's out of supply and attrits away. Um, he probably, oh yeah, he was a Mountaineer unit, okay, so he was fine. Um, so that's done, then we look over here, and basically, um, this guy is kaput, those guys are fine, um, these guys are gone, because of the Zox here and here, this guy is gone, this guy is gone. So things kind of get cleaned up there. I mean, we're causing many step losses via attrition alone uh, to the Axis. But, um, yeah, there you go. Okay, uh, so that's the attrition. And then the Axis gets an exploitation movement, um, which there's really not a whole lot for them to do there. Um, I think the only thing that we would maybe consider doing is giving up this oil hex to try to get more guys into Vienna, but I don't think that's really valuable. So, yeah, I don't think there's any exploitation movement that the Axis can do that really improves their situation more than it is already, you know, as good as it gets for them. Um, so then we have the cleanup phase, so, you know, we just pick up our Stavka markers and that's it. Uh, or not Stavka, our OK markers. Um, which we're all you know, all used on the uh, Eastern Front, basically. And that's it for the Axis side of the turn, so we'll go ahead and kick it over for the Allied stuff. The Allies need to figure out where they're going to put their Shafe Markers. I am going to have to shuffle them around quite a bit because I need to get things just so, uh, so that I can extend my supply lines. And this again gets into what I mentioned before, managing your Shafe markers, managing your Stavka markers, managing your OK markers are super important to this game's mechanics. Like, you really need to think through that. Um, there is a way to be as efficient as possible, I guess, and like, 
the sooner you realize how to operate very efficiently with those markers, the better you will do in the game, is what it seems like. Um, so, okay, I'm going to take care of the Allied Soviet action phase. We'll do the, the marker placement and the movement in combat, and I'll kind of show you the aftermath. I would expect the map to change maybe quite a bit by the time we're done. We'll see. Okay, here we are after the, uh, the Allied uh, operations phase. So I definitely figured out that, for the most part, it is faster to loop around here, based if you're if you're actually in northern Italy, it's faster just to go up through here, um, than to go to the med box, and then go to the England box, and then you know maybe there's some restriction on moving directly from the med theater to the northwest theater, but I don't really I didn't I don't remember seeing it. Um, but the uh, the Western Allies, you know, the the med is is done. We've got some garrison forces there. I arranged the chafe markers so that. We have plenty of supply coming through Marseille to reach, you know, this kind of whole area over here, including over here, um, which means we'll be able to pull off this beachhead marker at the end of the turn uh, for an invasion of Athens. Um, and then uh, through here, we actually moved north and managed to push back some Germans and eliminate some Germans. Over here, we eliminated some Germans and progressed forward. Uh, we did take Paris, which I forgot to mark on the victory point scale. Um, and we actually ran over here and eliminated these guys. It uh, cost us a step, but I just I don't want to have to worry about them in the backfield, and now I don't have to. So from here on out, the West is getting, you can see, cracked open pretty hard. Um, and the Germans are going to have to figure something out uh, to save the problem, and they just they're not going to have a lot of options, to be honest. Um, there, there's going to have to be a lot that they do to fix up the problem and to keep Allied exploitation from zooming too far in Western Germany. They, you know, the the Allies could actually sneak into Antwerp right now, um, and that would be uh, a pretty big problem. They'd have to deal with some guys that are stuck northwest of it before they could really make use of the the port. But still. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty darn good uh, for the Allies there. Um, the Axis line is, is pretty hurt. Uh, they're going to have to rearrange some things as best they can um, to, to defend what's left out there. Um, in the East, we didn't do as good as I was hoping. I mean, we did, we did take the last uh, Axis oil hex. We almost are into Buda, uh, Budapest. Uh, we just couldn't advance, so we have it under Zox. I don't think the Germans are going to try to hold on to it. I mean, they could sneak a unit in and then try to hold out there, but then they give up Vienna, and then we're running up to Berlin. So I think, like, this this path here is actually super valuable right now because the defense over here is holding up pretty well. I mean, we eliminated some units. The mountains caused some pretty nasty casualties on the Soviet side. Um, right now we have, like, six or seven units in the dead pile, our reinforcements or our replacements next turn aren't going to be so high as the Soviets. We actually do have to keep an eye on that replacement rate. And you can see, you know, we we're making some progress over here, but around Königsberg we still have a somewhat stout defense um, with those guys holding out in Riga. So um, I think it's I think this is going to be the really important aspect of what happens next and what can the Germans do to slow down the Soviet advances. You know, can they stop them in the south? And then, you know, in the West, the Allies are just surging through. So now we have the Axis reaction phase. So for the West, I'll have to figure something out. And the East, I mean, likewise, like, what can I do to save this situation? I don't know. So I'll come back after the uh, Axis reaction phase because it's so critically important to what happens next. Then there'll be the uh, Allied attrition uh, and then exploitation. So there's a couple of more. You know, we're going to have to look at the situation as it develops. I think each step here is going to be super important because each hex matters now a lot. Okay, uh, here we are after the um, exploitation movement segment. So there was definitely a chance that I could have grabbed Antwerp, but um, there would definitely be supply problems uh, for the units that would and would likely get cut off. So this, is, this gets back to that, like, yeah, sure, I could grab Antwerp, but then I would still have a lot of problems <laughs> that the Axis could respond to, because the Axis is going to go first. Uh, at the beginning of the next turn, right? So they'll, 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 there's no sense in screwing up our spearhead. You know, we're making progress. We still have three whole turns to go, 
but you can see like we're pressing into the mountains uh, there uh, out of Switzerland um, we've sort of we've tried to push through but the rivers and the uh, the rivers and the um, the, the rivers in the forest slow us down a huge amount. I, I might even need to make sure that this guy can even get to where he got. He was like, one, two, three. Maybe I can't, I can't, I can't remember where that guy was. Um, he, maybe he, I put him here. I think I counted right. That guy maybe is in that hex. He might be one hex ahead of where he's really supposed to be able to be. I'm not, I'm not sure. But you can see, I mean, we've got one problem. This guy is still in a supply fort, so we might have to leave someone behind to kind of watch him. Otherwise, we're trying to push through, trying to make it to the end. The final uh, FUSAG marker is pulled off because of how far east we are. Um, so from here on out, you know, and we're, oh, and we're bringing these guys back east now that they did their job. Now it really is just push, push, push as much as we can. Um, and then in the east, you know, you can see... We, we still can't, you know, because of where our armor is, um, you know, we're kind of getting slowed down over here. Uh, and it's amazing how Riga holds up so much, you know, because of that logistics stuff. Well, we did take Krakow, so that really gives us a lot of logistical capability. So does Budapest, really, to, you know, I, I think we keep focusing on the southern front as we can push our way through, you know, all the infantry are trying to catch up. Um, like I said, it becomes a north-south battle, and if we can break through to Prague, you know, that's really what is going to be, you know, the tough thing. Now, I will say, uh, we are up against the USIR, so if we attack the USIR next turn and can take it as the Soviets, <clears throat> then that will be one factory hex knocked off, and the Germans have a huge problem with uh, replacements, and then that'll be hopefully the collapse point, because we'll have a lot of bombing, um... And, and a lot of other things uh, where, you know, the Allies won't be able to do much. It's going to be really important, actually, um, to try to get the oil bombing to work because the oil bombing is going to enable us to keep the Germans from moving. And if we can keep the Germans from being able to pull back over here, like, we attack, eliminate, exploitation movement takes Western Germany, and boom, we're, you know, the war is reaching a, a conclusion. So I, I do think these last couple of turns, super critical, the, depending on how the die rolls go. Um, you know, for all the strength of the Soviets, you know, we're just reaching a point where it's hard to, to it's hard to break through some of these areas. Um, now that we've got more towns in Eastern Europe, you know, attacks this way are a little more feasible, but we just have so much more of our strength down here. Um, so I could, what I could do is try to do some transit movement and move them up over here or something. Um, but I think we're okay. Like, I, I think we're making progress. Um, pretty good progress at that. So, uh, we're going to have Alid, uh, the, the transit phase next, and then we'll do a final checkout of the victory for the video. Okay, uh, after the transit segment, the Germans just moved some stuff around a little bit, um, just to have some better coverage. It, it probably was useless, but it, there wasn't much to do on the west front. I moved, like, one unit. Um, on the east, there's nothing I could really do. Um, so transit movement for the axis just starts to become, like, not really even an issue. <laughs> like, there's nothing to do. Um, you know, I think I think as the Allies, you would only be doing things like transit bombing, maybe at the beginning of the game as Germany tries to transit units to the east front, maybe. And you would only be doing interdiction... I'm not exactly sure when. You know, the interdiction helps provide a penalty to the letter grade die roll, and I'm just not sure... I, I guess it would be useful under certain circumstances to negate a Luftwaffe, but I, I don't know. It would be tough. Um, tough to consider. I think the factory bombing is just so good. Maybe if the interdiction was a better penalty, like a minus two instead of a minus one, I'd be more interested in using it, but um, it is what it is, so probably not as useful. Uh, the Allies didn't do much transit movement. Um, well, actually, well, the Western Allies did. They pulled one unit further up. They put all the paratroopers in the box to be used for paratrooping, and we moved one unit from the med box to the England box. So, um, straightforward stuff there. Nothing nothing too crazy. Um, we did pull off a paratrooper to be in the med box, so we will, and our allied beachhead marker from the Marseille area so that we can invade Athens for a victory point next turn. Um, 
So then uh, this is a final word on victory right now. So you can see the game is, is condensing down to Germany itself, or just about to be as we exit France and head into Western Germany. The Allies currently sit at uh, Western Allies, have four victory hexes, Rome, Milan, uh, Marseille, and Paris. The Soviets have nine victory points uh, that are Trieste, uh, Belgrade, um, Sevastopol, uh, Dnepropetrovsk, Kiev, Kharkov, Minsk, uh, the area near Leningrad, and Tallinn. Um, and I think that all together that's nine. So four plus nine is 13. We're at 13 victory points. Um, we need to get at least four more if one of them is Berlin, um, or we need to get six more if we don't get Berlin. Um, the Western Allies are in sight of about four. <laughs> the uh, Soviets are about to get five or six or seven. So I think, just based on that alone, I, I do suspect this will be an Allied victory. Um, but we have to play it out, and we have to see. Next turn is a winter turn, so things are going to slow down a little bit, maybe. Um, but I think, or for the stop for the Soviets at least, but I think it, it won't matter too much, um, just because there there's going to be um, so many combats to overwhelm the Axis. So that's my bet. It'll be an Allied victory, but we'll see. So um, see you in the next one, guys, for turn ten. Till then, take care. Keep on gaming.